So to have someone that you love that is suffering from addiction, not only does it suck for the addict, it sucks for the people around the addict. And so to, to go through that journey and to find that hope and that healing, which is definitely there, you know, that's where the magic of life is. I Addicts that have come out on the other side and they've gone through 12 steps or they've gone through the journey of, uh, you know, powerlessness and connection, they're some of the most incredible, giving, caring, loving people because they've been through hell. When did you realize that you had a problem with drugs? Yeah, I think, well, I was in deep denial. People were pointing it out to me that, man, you really should not get high so much. You should, I mean, I, there's probably a hundred times we're close friends. I started to isolate. The deeper I got, when I was like smoking pot and we're having fun in high school and I was social, I mean, I remember in, in psychology class, I got high to do a talk because I was definitely afraid of public speaking. So I got stoned because it helped ease the tension. And I ended up giving a talk in psychology class uh, about uh, the dangers of THC and marijuana. <laughs> that's, that's how much of it. That a, sounds like, about right. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I remember I was in an acting class and we had a little skit where we're not supposed to talk. It's supposed to be a silent thing. And I had a friend of mine, uh, a gal who we hung out together and uh, we would, you know, get high together. We would party, we go to parties and stuff. And she was pretending to be a, uh, a drug dealer. And I was a drug buyer. And, she, and I gave her a little vial that was filled with speed in front of oh. the whole class. She, you know, she brought the, I mean, and now, and now again, I'm, I'm, I feel terrible that I did these sort of things, but it was, I mean, look back in the eighties, if, if people grew up in the 80s, cocaine had just come onto the scene. Speed, I mean, it, it was, it still is. Dr the way people do and consume drugs and the way, you know, jokes are made about them and, you know, there's different stages of life where, where we respond to things differently. But she actually had given me this little vial. I poured it out in front of this acting class. I had a rolled up dollar bill and I snorted speed in front is part of this. That's a shit that I did in high school. And the, the teacher came up after it was in there. I was like, oh, it's baking soda and some aspirin. But it was speed. I was literally you really snorted it. I snorted it in front of the whole freaking class. It's part of an acting skit. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty bold. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, you know, bold, stupid, dangerous, but also it kind of shows you where my life was, where I was just like, fuck, man, I don't even, you know, like, what, what's the point of all this? I just felt rejected. I didn't feel accepted in school. And part of me, you know, young, wanting to, kind of be anti, well, not kind of, it's totally anti-authorian. I, I was a nice guy though. I mean, I wasn't mean to people, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you that. I mean, I've always been, I think a, a pretty compassionate person. I wasn't hurting people. I was just hurting myself and I was taking dangerous, you know, risks and stuff like that. I, I mean, I was abused as a kid. I was raped and molested as a kid and I was paid money not to say anything about it. And that wired into my head that um, you know, sex as an example is not an intimate act of love and oneness. It's something you do to get off. I never saw a model of a healthy relationship. My father never remarried. I never heard I love you until maybe around the age of 18. Uh, you know, I mean, we moved all the time. Every time I would establish a relationship, it would be, you know, uprooted and we go somewhere else. So I became very used to losing my relationships, uh, abandonment. I remember going to a summer camp that my father sent me to in Texas uh, it was a it was a Catholic boys camp and the you know the um, what do you call them the uh, the, the camp the, the, no the camp counselors that that are the older I mean they're, they're more like young adults that take uh -huh. care of the kids yeah. the counselors I guess. yeah I mean they were they, they were abusing us I mean they were making us do sexual stuff to each other I mean it was it was pretty it's pretty terrible it's pretty bad and it and that stuff um, embeds really dark things into you and you you just feel like a uh, a piece of of meat you feel used you feel abused and uh and it was pretty dark so the the drugs helped those memories that would never go away uh it, it would numb them for a bit and it and it became a it became a way to do it and looking back though you know i mean i i, I love this definition of intimacy which i was given by uh 
a guy uh, that a friend introduced me to that I had first 12 stepped in 2003 at his first 12 step program at, at Sex uh, SA, Sex Addicts Anonymous. And he had introduced me to a guy who uh, spends his life just sponsoring sex addicts. And I never met him in person. He was never a sponsor of mine. But he had said to me a definition of intimacy, which is intimacy is a mutual exploration of a shared safe place. Abuse is anything that takes away the safe place and addictions are what we do to make ourselves feel good when we don't have a safe place. And I never felt safe. And so if you, when I've talked to a lot of addicts, if you don't feel safe in the world, you know, you're going to try to connect with something that either makes you feel safe, it gives a false sense of security or you're so numbed out, you don't even know the difference. And so, you know, it makes sense why if you're depressed, anxiety ridden, lonely, sad, feeling enormous fear. To get a free copy of the 12 step guide that I created for you, click on the link in the description below. You know, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to feel those feelings. It's just how you go about scratching the itch. So I was using ways to scratch the itch that worked temporarily, but they left me more and more wounded. And, you know, you, 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 you become physically addicted, mentally addicted. You become uh, spiritually um, distraught if you can feel any connection whatsoever. And then you couple people that were raised uh, under a, either, either a really strict religion or they had, you know, they had, they were gaslighted using God uh, as, as a way to um, manipulate them. It's really hard for them to find a spiritual connection. It's, you know, my, my, my buddy, Don Woods, who helps people with trauma, he's a doctor. Mm -hmm. He said that if you, uh, you know, if you under, if you looked at the atmospheric conditions of somebody's life, if you understood their atmospheric conditions is the way he refers to it, it would make sense the way that they are. And so anyone that's watching this or listening to this, that is, uh, you know, in, in active addiction is in recovery, uh, is an addict, uh, knows someone that's an addict, knows someone that's in pain, depressed. I mean, look at their lives. My, you know, my friend Gabor Mate, um, he, he has this, that great line. He says, the question is not why the addiction, but why the pain? You know, why is the pain there? If there's enough pain there, you're going to find coping mechanisms. You're going to find addiction as a way to deal with the pain. And so all of the stuff that I was doing uh, to this day, when I see someone smoking or drinking or any sort of obs obsessive out of control behavior, instead of saying, oh, that person's just making bad decisions, they're a moral degenerate. It's like, wh where are they hurt? You know, what, what, what pain are they trying to escape from? And that allows me to have, you know, more compassion for them and, and, and more compassion for myself. Because when you feel uh, resentment, when you feel anger, when you, when you feel rage, when you feel betrayal, you know, sometimes you, you, you're just so angry that you take it out on yourself. And if it gets really bad, then all of a sudden your reactions start affecting other people. And so when people get to the point where they're doing criminal behavior or they're hurting other people physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually, you're usually dealing with people that have uh, out of whack biochemistry. You know, Daniel Amen, who's the, the uh, brain doctor who scanned my brain six different times. I, I was doing an interview with him on one of my podcasts. Uh, and he said, uh, if you saw the brains of serial killers, you would rethink the death penalty because these are not normal brains. These are really sick brains. And if you take a look at, you know, the, what trauma can do to somebody, it alters the way you think, the way you react to life, uh, the biochemistry. And so, you know, addiction is a form of isolation. It's a, it's shame. It, it, I mean, addiction feeds off of shame and guilt and anger and resentment. And of course, you know, all this, I mean, you know, all this having been in recovery and, and what you do with, you know, sober living homes and, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I had to learn all this stuff though. That's a challenge. Try, trying to, to think your way out of a something that that's deeply embedded in your, at a cellular level is, is a, a difficult thing. I, I, I really applaud um, the heroic journey of people that go through recovery because not only is it incredibly difficult, uh, but society still doesn't accept and embrace addicts, you know, uh, because the symptoms of addiction uh, can hurt people that, you know, addicts in their worst state, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they cause trouble. 
they can commit crimes. They can be the most difficult people. So to have someone that you love that is suffering from addiction, not only does it suck for the addict, it sucks for the people around the addict. And so to, to go through that journey and to find that hope and that healing, which is definitely there, you know, that's where the magic of life is. I, addicts that have come out on the other side, and they've gone through 12 steps or they've gone through the journey of, uh, you know, powerlessness and connection. They're some of the most incredible, giving, caring, loving people because they've been through hell. You know, it's that saying you'll hear sometimes in 12 steps, which is, you know, religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people that have already been there. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in recovery that do 12 steps that are atheists. You know, they don't even believe in God. And so, you know, it's, it, you don't have to have a quote unquote strong belief in religion. You can still connect with source. You can still find ways uh, to, to connect. And I, and I often say that because I think a lot of people uh, like myself spent thousands of hours praying to a God they can never feel and were betrayed in church, had, had God and had religion used to manipulate them into you know, make excuses for doing, you know, terrible things to people when they're children. And so it's, it's very complicated. Uh, but through recovery, you know, one of my favorite recovery sayings is, uh, you know, recovery didn't open up the, uh, the uh, gates of uh, heaven to let me in, but it opened up the gates of hell to let me out. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I hear people say at, at 12 step meetings is I'm, I'm a grateful I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic or drug addict or, and, and it's, and, and I feel that way also. It's like, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I went through the journey that I went through because I wouldn't be who I am today without all of, without all of the wreckage. If you got value from this video, if you heard what you needed to hear, be sure to like it. Comment if you've got a question or you have something to say, subscribe to the channel. Camelback Recovery provides treatment services for people struggling with mental health, mental illness, addiction, alcoholism, whatever it may be. So if you or a loved one is struggling and you need some guidance and you need some direction, reach out to us. Our contact information is down below or you can go to our website, camelbackrecovery.com, whether it be detox, inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, sober living, recovery coaching, sober companion services, whatever it may be, like I said, we can either help you or make sure that you get sent in the right direction. We help people all over the country, all over the world for that matter. I'll see you on the next video.